I mean, to me personally, but I think to a lot of people, the human side of things is very interesting. So testing intelligence for humans. What, um, what do you think is a good test of human intelligence? Well, that's the question that psychometrics is, is interested in. And there's an entire subfield of psychology uh, that deals with this question. So what's psychometrics? The psychometrics is the subfield of psychology that, that tries to uh, measure, quantify aspects of the human mind. So in particular, cognitive abilities, intelligence, and personality traits as well. So uh, like what are, might be a weird question, but what are like the first principles of the, of psychometrics that is, operates on, the, you know, what, what, <laughs> what are the priors it brings to the table? So uh, it's a field with a, with a fairly long history. Um, it's, so, so, you know, psychology sometimes gets a, a bad reputation for not having very reproducible uh, results and some uh, psychometrics has actually some fairly solidly reproducible results. So the ideal goals uh, of the field is, you know, a test should be be reliable, which is a, a, a notion tied to reproducibility. It should be valid, uh, meaning that it should actually measure what you says, what you say it measures. Um, so for instance, if you're, if you're saying that you're measuring intelligence, then your test results should be correlated with things that uh, you expect to be correlated with intelligence, like success in school or success in the workplace and so on, should be standardized, meaning that uh, you can administer your tests to many different people in the same conditions. Uh, and it should be free from bias, meaning that, for instance, uh, if, you're, if, if your test involves uh, the English language, then you have to be aware that uh, this creates a bias uh, against people who have English as their second language or people who can't speak English at all. Um, so of course, these, uh, these principles for creating psychometric tests are um, very much an ideal. I don't think every psychometric test is, uh, is really either reliable, uh, um, valid, or, or free from bias, but at least the, the field is aware uh, of these weaknesses and is, is trying to address them. So it's kind of interesting. Um, ultimately, you're only able to measure, like you said previously, the skill, but you're trying to f do a bunch of measures of different skills that correlate, yes. as you mentioned, strongly with some general concept of cognitive ability. Yes, yes. So what's the G factor? So, right, there are many different kinds of, of tests, tests of uh, intelligence, and uh, each of them is interested in, in uh, uh, different aspects of intelligence. You know, some of them will deal with language, some of them will deal with uh, 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 spatial vision, maybe mental rotations, numbers, and so on. When you run these very different tests at scale, what you start seeing is that there are clusters of correlations uh, among test results. So for instance, if you look at uh, uh, homework at school, um, you will see that people who do well at math are also likely statistically to do well in physics. Mm. And what's more, uh, there, are, there are also people who do well at math and physics are also statistically likely to do well in things that sound completely unrelated, like writing an, an English essay, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so when you see clusters of correlations uh, in, in statistical, statistical terms, you would explain them with a latent variable. And the latent variable that would, for instance, explain uh, the relationship between being good at math and being good at physics would be uh, cognitive ability, right? Mm -hmm. And the G factor is the, the latent variable that explains uh, the fact that every test of intelligence that you can come up with results on that on, on, on this test end up being correlated. So there is some uh, single uh, uh, unique variable uh, that, that explains these correlations, that's the G factor. So it's a statistical construct. It's not really something you can directly measure, for instance, in a, in a person. Um, but it's there. But it's there, it's there, it's there at scale. And that's also one thing I want to uh, mention about psychometrics. Like, you know, when, when you talk about measuring intelligence in, in humans, for instance, uh, some people get a little bit worried. They will say, you know, that sounds dangerous. Maybe that sounds potentially discriminatory and so on. And they're not wrong. And the thing is, so personally, I'm not interested in psychometrics uh, as a way to characterize one uh, individual person. Like if uh, if I get 
your psychometric personality assessment or your IQ. I don't think that actually tells me much uh, about you as a person. I think psychometrics is most useful uh, as a statistical tool. So it's most useful at scale. Uh, it's most useful when you start getting test results for a large number of people and you start uh, cross-correlating these test results because that gives you information about the structure uh, of the human mind, in particular about the structure of human cognitive abilities. So at scale, psychometrics paints a certain picture of the human mind, and that's interesting. And that's what's relevant to AI, the structure of human cognitive abilities. Yeah, it g gives you an insight into it. I mean, to me, I remember when I learned about G-Factor, it seemed... Um... It, it seemed like it would be impossible for it even it, it to be real, even as a statistical variable. Like it felt uh, kind of like astrology. Like it's like wishful thinking among psychologists. But uh, the more I learned, I realized that there's some, I mean, I'm not sure what to make about human beings, the fact that the G factor is a thing. That th there's a commonality across all of human species. Yes. That there does seem to be a, a strong correlation between cognitive abilities. Yes. That's kind of fascinating. Like yeah, actually. so human cognitive abilities have uh, a structure, like the, the most mainstream theory of the structure of cognitive abilities is called uh, uh, CHC theory. It's uh, Cattle, Horn, Carroll, it's named after the, the three psychologists who contributed key pieces of it. And it describes uh, cognitive abilities as a hierarchy with three levels. And at the top, you have the G factor. Then you have broad cognitive abilities, uh, for instance, fluid intelligence, right? Um, that that encompass um, uh, a broad set of possible uh, kinds of tasks that are all uh, uh, related. And then you have uh, narrow cognitive abilities at the last level, which is uh, closer to task-specific skill. And, and th th there are actually different theories uh, of the structure of cognitive abilities that just emerge from different statistical analysis of uh, IQ test results. Uh, but they all describe uh, a hierarchy with a, a kind of G factor uh, at the top. And you're right that the G factor is, it's not quite real in the sense that it's not something you can observe and measure, like your height, for instance. But it's real in the sense that you, you see it in, in a statistical analysis of the data, right? One thing I want to mention is that the fact that there is a G factor does not really mean that human intelligence is a uh, general in a strong sense it does not mean human intelligence can can be applied to any problem at all and that someone who, who has a high IQ is going to be able to solve any problem at all. That's not quite what it means. I think um, one, uh, one uh, popular analogy to understand it is the sports uh, analogy. Uh, if you consider the concept of uh, physical fitness, it's a concept that's very similar to intelligence because it's a useful concept. It's uh, something you can intuitively understand some people are, are fit, uh, maybe like you, some people are not as fit, maybe like mm -hmm. me. Um, but none of us can fly. <laughs> absolutely. It's, so it's constrained to a specific even, set Even of if skills. you're very fit, that doesn't mean you can do uh, uh, anything at all in any environment. You, you obviously cannot fly, you cannot uh, survive at the bottom of, of the ocean and so on. And if, if you were a scientist and you, want, and you wanted to precisely define and measure physical fitness, in humans, then you would come up with a, a battery uh, of tests, uh, like you would, you know, have running hundred meter, uh, playing soccer, playing table tennis, swimming, and so on. And uh, if you run these tests over many different people, you would start seeing correlations in test results. For instance, people who are good at soccer are also good at, at sprinting, right? And uh, you would explain these correlations with. Uh, physical abilities that are uh, strictly analogous to cognitive abilities, right? And then you would start also observing uh, correlations between uh, biological uh, uh, characteristics, like maybe lung volume is correlated with being a, a, a fast runner, for instance. Uh, in the same way that there, there are neurophysical uh, uh, correlates uh, of cognitive abilities, right? And at the top, of the uh, hierarchy of physical abilities that you would be able to observe, you would have a, a G factor, a physical G factor, which would map to physical fitness, right? And uh, as you just said, that doesn't mean that uh, people with, a, with high physical fitness can fly. It doesn't mean uh, human morphology and human physiology is universal. 
it's actually super specialized. We can only do the things um, that we were uh, evolved to do, right? Like we, we are not appropriate to, to, to you, you could not exist on, on Venus or Mars or in the void of space or the bottom of the ocean. So that said, one thing that's really striking and remarkable um, is that uh, uh, our morphology uh, generalizes far beyond the environments that we evolved for. Like in a way you could say we evolved to run uh, after prey in the savanna, right? Mm -hmm. That's very much where our uh, human morphology comes from. And that said, we, we, can, we can do a lot of things that are, that are completely unrelated to that. We can climb mountains, we can, we can swim across lakes, uh, we can play table tennis. I mean, table tennis is very different from what we were evolved to do, right? Uh, so our morphology, our bodies, our, our sensorimotor affordances are of a degree of generality that is absolutely remarkable, right? And I think cognition is very similar to that. Our cognitive abilities have a degree of generality that goes far beyond what the mind was initially supposed to do, which is why we can you know, play music and write novels and, and, and go to Mars and do all, all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but it's not universal in the same way that human morphology and our body uh, is not appropriate for actually most of the universe by volume. In the same way, you could say that the human mind is not really appropriate for most of problem space, potential problem space uh, by volume. So we have very strong uh, cognitive biases, actually. That mean that there are certain types of problems that we handle very well and certain, certain types of problems that we are uh, completely inadapted for. So that, that's really how we interpret uh, the G factor. It's not a sign of strong generality. Uh, um, it's it's really just a broader, the broadest cognitive ability. Uh, but our abilities, whether we are talking about sensory motor abilities uh, or cognitive abilities, they they still they remain very specialized in the human condition, right? Within the constraints of the human cognition, they're general. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, but the constraints, as you're it, saying, are very limited. What, what's I think very what's yeah limiting. So we we evolved our cognition and our body evolved in in very specific environments because our environment was so variable, fast changing, and so unpredictable. Part of the constraints that that drove our evolution is generality itself. So we were in a way evolved to to be able to improvise in all kinds of of physical or cognitive environments, right? Yeah. Um, and for this reason, it turns out that uh, the, the minds and bodies that we ended up with uh, can be applied to much, much broader scope than what they were evolved for, right? And that's truly really remarkable. And that goes, that's a degree of generalization that is far beyond anything you can see in artificial systems today, right? Um, that's it. it. It does not mean that, that uh, uh, human intelligence is anywhere universal. It's, yeah, it's not general. 